Uh, welcome everybody to today's NPA seminar and allow me to welcome Mike Walensky. Mike is currently a postdoc at the John Rule Bank Center for Astrophysics at the University of Manchester, where he works on analyzing the latest data from the hydrogen epoch of reionization array, a high redshift 21 centimeter array in the Karoo Desert in South Africa, targeting cosmic dawn and the epoch of reionization. He was awarded his PhD in 2021 from the University of Washington, where he analyzed data from radio telescopes like the Murchison Whitefield Array to obtain some of the most sensitive limits on the 21 centimeter power spectrum during the cosmic reionization due date. His current focus is on developing novel statistical methods to improve the ways we characterize instrumental effects such as antenna beams and how we interpret observed anomalies across multiple data sets as in the edges or C comparison. Take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about data analysis in 21 centimeter cosmology uh, with a particular focus on reionization, just because that's what my background is almost exclusively in. But a lot of these techniques will also be useful for um, other areas of 21 centimeter cosmology and pot potentially things beyond radio as well. So this is sort of uh, the roadmap for today. I'm going to first talk about what the 21 centimeter line is and why it's important for cosmology. Then I'll get to the main topic, which is challenges in 21 centimeter cosmology. There's sort of three uh, broad categories of challenges that we face, which is foreground modeling. So modeling other radio sources like galaxies and stars that are intervening between us and the cosmic signals that we're looking for. Instrumental modeling, like the electromagnetic response of the antennas and whatnot, and then anomaly detection, so finding things like rogue radio signals from digital TV in your data. Um, I've done work on instrumental modeling and anomaly detection, so I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've done in those two categories. I'll just bring up foreground modeling shortly and, and, and go through it pretty quickly because I haven't done a ton of work there, but it's really important for setting the um, problem, kind of the background of the problem, um, and then I'll conclude. So the 21 centimeter line is a emission line from neutral hydrogen. So if you look at the ground state of neutral hydrogen and consider uh, the magnetic interaction between the proton and the electron, then you can just um, theorize about what is the hyperfine structure of hydrogen, which is uh, illustrated here. So there is a uh, triplet of spin symmetric states at a higher energy level than this spin anti-symmetric state uh, down at the bottom here. And anytime you have a transition from the triplet state down to the singlet state, a 21 centimeter photon is emitted. That has a frequency of about 1.4 gigahertz. So that's a radio frequency. So uh, you can use radio telescopes to find um, astronomical neutral hydrogen. Now, the lifetime of this decay is like 30 million years in a single hydrogen atom. So uh, the reason uh, that is useful is that you can use this as a proxy to find large quantities of neutral hydrogen. Basically, if you found a sizable amount of 21 centimeter radiation, you know there must have been tons and tons and tons of, of neutral hydrogen. So it's a, a really good indicator of, of where the hydrogen is. Uh, so the um, process of mapping out where the hydrogen is is sometimes called hydrogen intensity mapping. Um, so why is it important? Uh, so it can tell us a lot about structure formation in the universe. So uh, this is a standard story that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So a basic prediction of general relativity is that the universe is expanding. And uh, we see lots of observational evidence for this. We have some observations at the early universe, such as the cosmic microwave background, and some observations from the late universe in terms of supernovas and things like that. And interestingly, these uh, different data predict different expansion rates. So there are certain tensions in cosmology. That's just that's just the big one. We call that the Hubble tension. Um, and part of the problem here is we don't have a lot of uh, intervening data between this early and late universe measurements to kind of nail these these cosmological modeling issues down. <clears throat> so um, as this universe expands, it goes through phase transitions. Uh, so if you look around today and look at all of the neutral hydrogen, or sorry, look at all the hydrogen in the intergalactic medium, what you find is most of it's ionized. However, we know from the cosmic microwave background that there must have been a time in which most of the universe was neutral hydrogen in terms of its baryon content. 
So uh, we know there must have been a phase transition at some point where the hydrogen went from being predominantly neutral to being predominantly ionized. And we call that phase transition the epoch of reionization. And this is a period of the universe's history that is largely unconstrained by observational probes. We know about when it began, about when it began, and about when it ended. Um, but we don't know a lot about the details intervening between the beginning and the end. And the 21 centimeter line, since it can tell us where the neutral hydrogen is at any point in cosmic history, can tell us a lot more detailed information about how it proceeded. Reionization is uh, deep, like intimately connected to star formation and galaxy formation. So if we understand where uh, the hydrogen is, we can understand how galaxies formed and other astrophysical processes like that. That's it's very interesting. <clears throat> there are other measurements that we can do with the 21 centimeter line. So if we focus a bit after reionization um, and uh, look, take similar measurements, then we can understand things about the baryon acoustic oscillation scale, and that will ultimately allow us to constrain the dark energy equation of state, which is um, something we would like to understand because dark energy is very mysterious. Uh, I forgot to mention that in all of these experiments, we're looking so far back in time that the universe has expanded by a factor of a few since then. So we don't actually look for 21 centimeter photons. We actually look for redshifted 21 centimeter photons. For reionization, this is frequencies of anywhere from like 70 to 250 megahertz, depending on your model and what history you believe. Um, and then uh, for this VAO stuff, it's at a redshift of two. So that would be a wavelength of like 60 centimeters. So this is a simulation of the reionization signal or the 21 centimeter signal over the epoch of reionization and during cosmic dawn. So over at the left are lower frequencies, uh, which are um, just like older cosmic epochs. Towards the right are newer cosmic epochs. And uh, the top panel kind of shows a slice of what the 21 centimeter signal would look like in a 3D cube. And the bottom shows the globally averaged signal over the entire cube. And the globally averaged signal clearly has these structures that uh, indicate different parts of this phase transition. Um, whereas the kind of more detailed information in the top panel can tell us a bit more about um, how galaxies formed and stuff like that. So if you imagine taking a horizontal slice through the top panel, you would occasionally hit pockets where there is no 21 centimeter emission and occasionally hit pockets where there is some. And so we expect that there is some spectral structure in the 21 centimeter signal that we're looking for. And uh, that will be important when I describe foregrounds. So before I get into that, I just wanna talk about quickly review how radio interferometers work. Uh, so basically you just take two or more antennas. Uh, the emission from distant radio sources will hit these antennas at different times. The lag between when the emission arrives at the different antennas is a function of how separated the antennas are. We call that separation the baselines. So if I say the word baselines, I'm talking about an antenna pair and how separated they are. And then um, that lag is also determined by where the source is on the sky. So if you imagine moving the source over by a bit, you change where this leg of the triangle is. And so it gives you a different phase difference between these two voltage signals from these antennas. We can correlate the voltage signals from the antennas uh, and create something that we call visibilities. And that's kind of the raw interferometric data pro pro product uh, that we use to do analysis. <clears throat> so uh, one of the ways that we uh, can learn about reionization is to make what's called a power spectrum of the sky. So how to make a power spectrum is you can imagine starting with a 3D map of the sky. Uh, where this Rx and Ry coordinates are like angles on the sky if you're looking up, and this D is like a line of sight distance coordinate. And to make a power spectrum, you would just Fourier transform and square this, and you'd have a power spectrum cube. These Kx and Ky wave modes uh, basically are your angular wave modes, and then this K parallel are what we call line of sight wave modes. Now, interferometers work in this sort of hybrid space where they are naturally measuring the angular wave modes in a place that we call the UV plane. And then we can use, since we're looking for a red-shifted but narrow line of emission, we can use the frequency axis as a distance proxy for where the emission is coming from, right? So uh, we have the D-axis due to cosmological redshift, but, and we already have angular wave modes being measured by the interferometer. So what some analyses do is they skip Instead of going up to image space and then Fourier transforming over, they just Fourier transform down the frequency axis and square, and that gets them a power spectrum. 
Um, once you have this 3D power spectrum, you can imagine doing different things. So one thing we do is integrate it in rings and get a 2D power spectrum. These are really useful diagnostic plots, and I'll be showing a few of those later. When you want to compare to theory, you integrate in spherical shells, um, and that is what you do when you want to do inference about actual cosmology. Okay, so uh, I've kind of brought up the motivation and talked about the background and why we care. Now I'm going to get into challenges, starting with foreground modeling. So uh, the problem with foregrounds is that they're really bright. So this is a uh, map of synchrotron radiation at 408 megahertz called the Haslam map. And uh, it has a brightness temperature, depending on where you look, of anywhere from 10 to 1,000 Kelvin at 400 megahertz. That's slightly higher frequencies than we use for reionization, and the foregrounds are brighter at lower frequencies. The cosmic signal that we're looking for is order millikelvin. So the intervening galactic emission and extragalactic emission is four to five orders of magnitude brighter than the target signal that we're looking for. So the only way we'll be able to find it is if we can somehow separate the target signal from the foregrounds. Um, to do that, we can employ what's called a foreground avoidance strategy. So this is a cartoon of a 2D power spectrum. The horizontal axis shows the perpendicular wave modes, which you can sort of think of as angular wave modes. And the, the vertical axis shows the line of sight wave modes. Because the foregrounds are mostly synchrotron emission, free free emission, they have spectrally smooth, that they're, they are spectrally smooth, which means if you do a Fourier transform down the frequency axis, you expect the foreground emission to live towards the bottom of this plot at the lower order line of sight wave modes. So that's that red region that we expect the intrinsic foreground emission to live. There's another region of the space called the foreground wedge, which is a coupling between the smooth structure of the foregrounds and the natural chromaticity of an interferometer that throws power up towards higher line of sight wave modes that, that can't really be undone. It's just a natural uh, feature of interferometers that causes this mode mixing. Above this, there's a maximum delay or a maximum line of sight wave mode towards which that contamination can go. Um, and above that is the EOR window. If we've done our analysis and there are no systematics in the data, then that is where we can uh, expect to find our target signal in this space up in the UR window. So the goal is to, in a foreground avoidance strategy, uh, calibrate the instrument and model the foregrounds well enough such that there's no excess power in the EOR window. And if we deem that that is the case, then maybe we can do some cosmological inference. So next I'll talk about modeling the instrument, which is another really important feature that couples into foreground modeling in um, kind of a really nasty and difficult way. Uh, so there's different types of, you can broadly class uh, instrument modeling into kind of two different regions. So a lot of it just has to do with, well, all of it has to do with just modeling the response of the instrument. Um, but the two, the two categories I want to talk about are direction-dependent effects and direction-independent effects. So the direction dependent effects are usually related to the electromagnetic response of the receiving elements, the antennas. Uh, so depending on the shape of the receiver um, and, and other things, uh, basically it will respond to radiation at different points on the sky in different amounts. And uh, this is something that you have to understand extremely accurately in order to be able to calibrate the instrument. Then there are direction independent effects, which we often just call gains. And um, those are basically just amplifications uh, that you need to undo uh, that the instrument naturally does as part of the antenna response, but also just as part of the digital signal pipeline. Um, there's other effects like reflections in the cables uh, that you need to take out, as well as mutual coupling between antennas because it's an interferometer. Uh, and unless you're doing VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, these receiving elements see each other in an electromagnetic sense, and it affects their beam pattern. Um, so we have to get this right because uh, the way calibration works is that we essentially forward model uh, the sky through the instrument and then try and statistically calibrate the gains out of the instrument. So if we have a foreground model uh, that is 10 to the four times brighter than our target signal, uh, that has errors in it, and we're using that to calibrate the instrument, then these couple in a really nasty way uh, such that um, just the, the errors compound and occlude your ability to understand what's going on. So question. 
permanent visual astronomy, astronomy, we can only look at the bright skies to do calibration on our instrument. A lot of the you know, systematic errors fall out and look at the bright sky. Is there anything equivalent? You can do 21 centimeters, look at some kind of flat field or something. Um, so it kind of depends on the instrument. So you you would need at the minimum. So, okay, there's a question of whether or not the calibration solution is stable, right? So you might have gains that are at this amplitude on some night, but then at this amplitude on another night. So it's not like you can just look at a bright source on night one, call that the gains, and then use that for the rest of the season. Now, if you have a steerable instrument, you could look off to a calibrator once in a while. That's very, very bright. But to do that, you need a steerable instrument and also a beam that's narrow enough to isolate that calibrator source. Uh, a lot of the instruments that are really good for intensity mapping are good for it because they're wide field instruments and therefore see kind of a wide swath of the sky at any one time. And so it's hard to, to do this sort of calibration routine where you look at one calibrator source. The other problem you run into is that some of these instruments aren't actually steerable in real time. Uh, in which case you just you just can't do that method. <clears throat> um, so this is the intro to a jackknife test that I'll be talking about. So what we have here are spectral energy distribution measurements from three different instruments at three different frequencies. We've got the LWA at 73 megahertz, Haslam at 408 megahertz, and then Meerkat up at about 1,000 megahertz. And uh, you expect from synchrotron radiation to maybe have a curved power law that would fit the data over these frequencies. But what you find is if you fit a curved power law, it misses the Haslam data by several sigma, which indicates that there is some sort of tension between this power law model and some of these data points. We think that this is a calibration artifact in the Haslam map. And we also think there are calibration artifacts in the Meerkat data. So for instance, if you look at this, there's kind of a step function uh, about 40% of the way through the band when you would expect something that's uh, sort of continuous and smooth across that entire observing range. So I'm going to introduce a Bayesian jackknife test framework that I have constructed uh, that will help us cross calibrate these instruments uh, with, with, with each other. So I made this jackknife framework to solve a problem for the hydrogen epoch of reionization array, which is a radio interferometer in Peru, South Africa. It is a low frequency instrument looking for reionization. So it operates from 50 to 250 megahertz. And it is a close packed hexagonal configuration of 14 meter parabolic dishes. These dishes are not steerable. They just look straight up at the sky and watch it go overhead. The uh, problem that was faced by Hera is that they wanted to do a power spectrum analysis using their entire first season of data. However, the array was still under construction during the first season. So plotted here in pink is the total number of antennas in the array over the course of the season. In green is the total number of working antennas according to our quality metrics. So there's kind of the same number of antennas throughout the entire season that are working. Uh, despite the fact that we're building more. At any rate, the observing season kind of naturally divides into these four observing epochs. And the question that we want to answer is, are we justified in combining the data from these different epochs to make a deep power spectrum measurement, given the fact that the array was kind of in a different configuration in each of these epochs? So to do that, we can make power spectra for each epoch independently and then see if they're statistically consistent. So to do that, I made something called Kyborg. This is a toy representation of how the Hera problem could have done, could have gone. Each of these color-coded data sets are basically toy representations of different, different power spectra for the different epochs, just drawn from a Gaussian distribution. The black data are drawn from a zero mean Gaussian distribution, which is consistent with like a null hypothesis that the data are just consistent with noise. The red data points are drawn from a slightly biased distribution, which kind of indicates, uh, and the bias is the same for all four epochs. So that would kind of indicate a type of consistency where all of the epochs are seeing something signal-like um, and it's all at about the same level. The blue data set indicates a catastrophe where the uh, epic zero here has a 
uh, large outlier that is not seen in the other epochs and therefore indicates something wrong has happened in epoch zero that perhaps has not happened in epochs one, two, and three. So the point of Kyborg is to go and test a bunch of hypotheses about which epochs are biased and which ones aren't and see which is the most likely one that fits the data. Uh, and it's uh, available on GitHub, uh, and uh, we wrote a paper about it as well in case anyone ends up being interested and wants to read about it. So the formalism for Kyborg is that it is a, it is a Bayesian method. Uh, so we have a posterior probability that we are interested in calculating. Uh, it's sort of a question answering machine. So what you do is you pose a bunch of hypotheses. These hypotheses basically in each one, you just specify which of the data you think are biased and which of the data you do not think are biased. And then you calculate the posterior probability of that hypothesis conditional on some measurements and some model of the statistical uncertainties within the data. Now, in order to do this, you have to specify mathematically what you mean by each of these hypotheses. So what we do is we specify a distribution of biases that could have occurred under each of these hypotheses, and then we marginalize over that to get the marginal likelihood. We normalize by a prior. Uh, this prior is to state which data are more suspicious than other data a priori for the Hera problem. We think all epochs are equally suspicious, so we just use a flat prior there. And we normalize and we get the posterior. That's sort of how the math works. The results on the Hera data were as follows. So Hera made power spectrum measurements in at two different frequencies and in several different fields uh, that they reported recently in an upper limits paper. And what I'm showing here is basically the posterior probability of all of the different bias configurations that Kyborg considered. So uh, on the horizontal axis of each plot is just the different wave modes for the power spectra. And on the vertical axis, I'm specifying which epochs are biased under the hypothesis. So at the bottom, that's basically the null hypothesis saying none of these are biased. And up towards the top is the hypothesis where all of them are biased. And then there are ranges in between. Uh, so what we see here is that most of the posterior mass is contained towards the bottom of each of these plots, which is suggesting that most of the power spectra from all of the epochs are consistent with the null hypothesis. And therefore, we think that they are consistent and are not in possession of bad systematic effects that would uh, prevent us from combining them into a deep power spectrum upper limit. So this kind of statistically justified combining these smaller data sets into one larger, more sensitive data set which was important. Now, if you look closely at a couple of these bands and fields, for instance, uh, band one field C here, you can see that there is a consistent detection of some sort of bias in epoch one. If you actually go and look at the power spectra, you can see that. So these are all of the power spectra from all of the epochs and all of the bands and fields. The transparent data points are the ones that were not identified as suspicious from Kyborg, and the opaque, opaque ones are identified as outlying according to Kyborg. Uh, and you can see here in band one field C, these orange data points, which represent epoch one, are consistently a few sigma above zero. So um, we applied Kyborg in sort of a semi blind way, where we took a look at this uh, before taking a look at that. Uh, so you could use this in a blind analysis pipeline to look for um, anomalies that uh, could cause problems, and then you could go and hypothesize about what those anomalies are and try and go fix them before you make your final power spectrum measurement. We didn't actually change anything here because most of the fields looked fine, but good in principle. Okay, so back to this cross calibration jackknife. Um, so this is actually the same data shown before. So the teal points here were the raw uncorrected data before we did our jackknife test. And the dotted black line here shows that curved power law fit that misses Haslam by a few sigma. And basically what we did is we took Kyborg and we modified the math a little bit so that we could look for calibration biases instead of additive biases. And then we uh, went and figured out what the most likely hypothesis was for all of our different fields that we looked at. And for this field, we found that the most likely hypothesis was that every single experiment had calibration errors and that actually Probably there was it wasn't curved power law. A power law without curvature is more likely to explain the data. So the revised 
uh, fit to this data is shown with the black dashed line with the shade to show the posterior uncertainty on the power law. The uh, purple data here show uh, the gain offsets that we ended up estimating um, under, under the most likely hypothesis. And uh, what you can see is that there are very large, likely to be very large errors in the LWA and Haslam uh, calibration. Whereas if you look at the Meerkat data, there's a, there's a substantial calibration offset uh, that's slightly different in the two bands that sort of rectifies that discontinuity that I was showing earlier, uh, but it's not nearly as bad as the LWA and Haslam in, in this field. So this is kind of cool because um, we were able to kind of assess from multiple instruments, take their measurements, weigh them against a model and consider whether or not there was some sort of systematic bias. And we were able to point towards what the type of systematic bias was, which we think is probably very useful. So now I'm going to talk about beam modeling, right? So this is modeling the electromagnetic response of the receiving elements. So pictured here is a simulation of the electromagnetic response of the Hera Vivaldi feed at 150 megahertz, which is their newest feed that they're using right now. And uh, what you can see is that there's a lot of spatial structure in this beam. And uh, this is a simulation of the ideal receiving element. And due to manufacturing inconsistencies and other experimental circumstances, this is probably not what the actual electromagnetic response looks like in the field. This also ignores mutual coupling between the different antennas and the interferometer. So to address this problem, we are coming up with a Bayesian inference framework to be able to infer imperfections in the beam model from the visibility data. Uh, so to, in order to do that, what we have to do is parameterize the beam in terms of some analytic functions and then go and constrain those parameters in a Bayesian way. So uh, we wound up picking a basis in terms of Bessel functions and Fourier modes. The particular basis is not that important. What matters for the basis is whether or not it's fairly compact and can describe the beam with relatively few basis functions. So in order to assess the usefulness of this basis, we made what I call a Fourier Bessel energy spectrum. So what you do is you take that electromagnetic simulation, you then do a least squares fit to it using this basis, and you look at what the relative size of each of the fit coefficients is. This is on a log scale that spans six orders of magnitude, so most of the power in this fit lives in the top 24 modes, uh, which are dipole modes, which is what you expect because it's a dipole hung above a uh, dish with circular cross-section. Um, and then you can see that there's a few other modes that contribute to the fit, but not quite as much. So this seems from this analysis to look like a relatively uh, sparse basis that we can use to describe perturbations to the beam. Um, just to kind of see how it looks as we use more and more basis functions, what we did is we uh, chose uh, decreasingly sparse uh, choices from this set of basis functions and then looked at the root mean square error of the fit compared to the electromagnetic simulation. And we did this for two different feeds. So during the first season, they used a uh, different dipole than they've been using in subsequent seasons. The orange is the new one, the blue is the old one. And you can see that the RMS error of the fit goes down as you use more and more basis functions and it goes down in kind of a predictable way. We think that uh, using hundreds of basis functions is probably computationally tractable for our purposes, but um, there are a few other things that you might have to consider. So if you're using some sort of fit for the beam, you have to consider the spectral structure because if you induce spurious spectral structure and then make a power spectrum measurement, then you could throw off your ability to measure the cosmic signal. So we've done a test to make sure that if we do a per frequency fit, we don't end up with spurious spectral structure. And that seems to be uh, working OK. However, these tests assume perfect instrumental calibration, which is not necessarily, well, it's definitely not a valid assumption, because if you have errors in your beam model, then the way that we do the forward modeling for the calibration, uh, that this, this type of error will induce calibration errors. And we haven't tested how severe they are for varying levels of sparsity yet. Uh, so that's something we still have to do. OK, um, so a 
standard power spectrum pipeline kind of proceeds like this. You do some pre-processing, which involves uh, what's called RFI flagging. So just finding data that are corrupted by radio frequency interference and removing them from the data so that you don't have them contribute to your analysis in a bad way. Do some basic corrections. Then you assume a perfect beam in sky model, which of course you don't have in practice. You fit the gains per antenna as a function of frequency, which because you made bad assumptions up above uh, will cause calibration errors that can then occlude your signal. And then uh, you pass everything through, assuming everything above is perfect. And then the only thing you quote in the final power spectrum limit is the thermal uncertainties, which I feel is an unfair representation of your actual knowledge of the power spectrum. So a formal way to handle this is to make this entire pipeline Bayesian. Uh, the problem is that it is computationally extremely expensive to do because there are just tons and tons of nuisance parameters that you have to constrain. So uh, it's not that people think that these assumptions are justified and are just uh, covering their eyes and covering their ears. It's just that uh, the challenge of actually making a Bayesian pipeline is, is very, very difficult. So this is something that uh, Bill Ball, who I've been working with for a couple of years, um, is ambitious enough to pursue. So we're making something called Hydro, which is a fully Bayesian 21 centimeter power spectrum estimation pipeline. The idea is to make use of something called Gibbs sampling, which is a Markov chain Monte Carlo method for sampling from a complicated probability distribution that's very highly dimensional. Um, so we want to have the Bayesian posterior, not only for our power spectrum measurement, but also for all of our nuisance parameters so that we can understand how all of these different instrumental um, effects couple to one another in our analysis. So uh, the way that Gibbs sampling works is you just rotate through all of the different nuisance parameters and sample from their conditional probability distributions. And so, um, and that gives you samples from the joint distribution. So Hydra has kind of several heads that it rotates through uh, and you sample from them in turn and that, that produces the samples that you need to characterize the errors and all of these different instrumental parameters uh, and also the power spectrum and errors in your sky model. So I've listed here the different people uh, in our group that are kind of working on these different heads of Hydra. I've been doing the beam modeling stuff. I talked a bit about that. There's other parts that, that we need to include. Now, there's one thing that I've left out that's really important for power spectrum estimation, which is finding anomalies in the data uh, that you that you didn't model and getting rid of them. Um, so this, these are things like RFI. There's other types of anomalies, but I'm just going to talk about RFI uh, for the remainder of this talk. RFI is something that's very hard to model uh, because it's just very complicated. There are a lot of different transmitters around the world and a lot of different things that these transmitted signals could bounce off of, like satellites and airplanes and the moon and such. And so developing a fully realistic model of how much RFI is in your data at which frequency is, is quite difficult. And it is probably the thing that maybe is the hardest to incorporate in this type of framework, but ultimately it's something that I think we as a, as, as a 21 centimeter community will have to do if we want to place confident constraints on the power spectrum. So, Clearly, I'm going to start talking about anomaly detection now. Uh, and to discuss that, I will talk about a MWA upper limit that I led uh, that I wrote a paper, just got accepted on Tuesday. I'm very happy about it. Um, OK, so as I've been saying, RFI is just anthropogenic radio signals that wind up in the telescope that you didn't want there. Um, this is an example of a HERA spectrum from 50 to 250 megahertz or thereabouts. Each one of these little spikes in it is an RFI signal. And this is problematic for power spectrum analysis because this RFI has very sharp spectral structure, which means that if you were to do a Fourier transform down the frequency axis to get your power spectrum, then uh, this would throw power up into those higher order line of sight wave modes that you need to keep clear for estimating the EOR signal. So some of the characters that are here in this spectrum are FM radio here, uh, Orbcom is a constellation of satellites that do uh, lots of GPS stuff that's really useful. They transmit at 137 megahertz and are very, very bright. There's uh, TV at 174 and above. What's seen here is mostly analog TV. There's also digital TV that we see in the data quite often. 
And then I think this is a couple people talking on a walkie talkie, but I'm not sure. Um, so once upon a time, I did a calculation, a uh, semi-analytic calculation to figure out what the effect of having RFI in your data is on the power spectrum measurement in the sense, if you have RFI of a given brightness, how bright is the contamination in the power spectrum from just that source? So the black line on these panels is a fiducial model for the cosmic signal, which is down and in about 10 millikelvin squared. And uh, on the left are two different R RFI sources in the blue and green uh, at one millijansky brightness. So a jansky is the brightness of like a typical radio source at these frequencies, a fairly bright radio source. So a millijansky of RFI uh, is a really, really faint RFI signal. And if we can get the total RFI brightness in the observation down to that, then it's possible that we'll be able to measure the EOR signal. Uh, so that's a pretty high demand. Based on some analyses that I've done with actual observations, I think the right-hand panel is probably a better representation of where we are in terms of the RFI flux in our deep power spectrum integrations, which means we have a couple orders of magnitude to go in terms of cleaning the RFI out of our data. So, thank you. Okay, but surely we put these telescopes in very remote locations so that they don't get affected by RFI very often, right? Um, so, turns out it finds its way in there anyway. So this is one season of MWA data or thereabouts. Each of these dots is a little two minute observation. And the color of the dot tells you the fraction of the observation that is contaminated by RFI. So if you add all this up over the entire season, it's about 10% of the data. And uh, that's not that much, right? If it's just 10%, we could throw out 10% and probably obtain the sensitivity that we want. But there's kind of a question, which is if you use some RFI flagging, RFI detection algorithm uh, to find the RFI in the observation, there's going to be some threshold of RFI that it doesn't find, right? So the question is, is there RFI that survives in these observations that we can't detect at the single observation level, but that we can detect in a power spectrum measurement? Can we find the residual RFI in these observations and see its effect on our measurement and see if it's bad or if it's fine? So to do that, we made loads and loads of these power spectrum jackknife tests. So I'm gonna show some, just one of the jackknife tests that we did. So we flagged the data with an algorithm that I wrote called SINs. Uh, so when we, flag an observation and we find that it had no RFI in it, we call it pure. Uh, when it has RFI in it, we say it's been absolved of its sins. So what we did is we made power spectra with groups of observations that we that were absolved, that we found RFI in. Then we found some matching observations that were pure, and then we made power spectra and compared them, right? So this is about 20 minutes of data. You do not expect to see signals in the EOR window with 20 minutes of data. And what we see here in the absolved, so if we, let me talk about the pure power spectrum. So you see lots of speckling of purple and yellow here. So what that means is that this window is approximately noise limited. If you look over here in the absolved observation, what you find is that there's this kind of smooth yellow orange contamination. Um, so there's something signal like that's sort of coherent on those wave modes. So that's indicative of a systematic effect at these integration depths. Now, what we can do is we can take these observations that we know has uh, something bad in them. We can turn the RFI flags off and form what we call repentant observations, make the power spectra using the same calibration solution so we don't recalibrate or anything, and then difference them and see if the signal is worse with the flags off or about the same. So we form this difference power spectrum. So blue in this difference power spectrum means that the repentant observations had a stronger power spectrum than the absolved ones. So we see that turning the flags off enhances the signature of this signal that we see in observations that are preferentially observations that have uh, been identified as containing RFI according to SINs. So um, basically this is like a smoking gun. There is residual RFI in these observations that is causing problems uh, for our power spectrum measurement. Now, when we integrate very deeply, 
we don't necessarily see this footprint. It sort of depends on which observations we use. So if we use only pure observations and we integrate very, very deeply, like many hours, uh, then we find a different type of uh, signature in the window. It could be a different type of systematic. It could be a different type of RFI that we're not catching, uh, but it is notably different. So that's all to say that it may be the case that these this RFI contamination integrates somewhat incoherently. And as we integrate deeper and deeper, we can maybe hope that it diminishes a bit. And ultimately, I think we need to place more observational constraints on these deep integrations so that we can understand how it's affecting our power spectrum measurements. So I just want to present my final power spectrum upper limit for this data set. So the uh, data on the, the left-hand column was made with only east-west aligned dipoles. These dipoles were found to preferentially contain the RFI footprint that we had identified, so we expect it to be slightly worse than the north-south polarized dipoles, which is the right-hand column. There are some geometric reasons for why we expect to see it in the east-west dipoles and not the north-south ones. I don't really want to get into it right now, but I will be happy to get into it if someone asks. Um, and uh, there's some other structure in these power spectra that are very typical with or well, characteristic of MWA power spectra, which are these bumps here, these evenly spaced bumps. So these are our coarse band harmonics. These show up because of a digital filter that we have to apply. Uh, to the data when we acquire it and um, are just an artifact from our data processing. In between these coarse band harmonics, you see that there's a lot of gray shading. So when the gray shading reaches all the way down to the bottom of the plot, what that means is that that bin is noise limited. And this is one of the first limits uh, that we found that the region in between the coarse band harmonics was largely noise dominated in both polarizations. So both polarizations look fairly similar here. And so that's uh, something that's actually very special about this upper limit. Now, the catch is that in order to make this limit, we had to throw out every single observation that had even one, one time integration that had RFI in it. So that meant throwing away 85% of our data. Now, not all of that was cutting from RFI. We also do an ionospheric quality metric cut. So basically, if the ionosphere is too active, then we can't calibrate the instrument reliably, and we have to throw out that data as well. So if you combine those two cuts, uh, then we throw away 85% of the data. So at that rate, we would need to, like, I, I forget what the calculation is, but it's like dozens of years of data in order to detect the EOR. So this is not a strategy that we can really take going forward, which is why I am proposing that we really ultimately uh, try to model the RFI, parameterize it, and constrain it so that we can understand what the uncertainty is on this power spectrum a little better in the presence of uh, such a pernicious systematic. All right. So in summary, uh, I, I think there's hope, uh, but we're going to have to get a lot more clever about the analysis methods that we use. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges that uh, we need to overcome, like instrument modeling, foreground modeling, anomaly detection. Uh, but if we can overcome these things, then we'll have a really important probe for uh, the early universe and large scale structure formation. And so I think it's worth overcoming these things. Um, I think that Bayesian methods are um, like probably formally the best choice for this just because uh, of the way that they sort of jointly handle all of the different nuisance parameters and the way that they naturally propagate uncertainty without you having to do a lot of things by hand once you get them up and running, that is. Um, so I'm just going to get on my stump and preach phase for a while, I guess. Um, I think that it will help us avoid cutting lots of data. Uh, and our cutting strategies we've shown is basically insufficient for getting a detection at some point or another anyway. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I have to say today. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, does anyone have any questions? So there's some ideas where you could do like online RFI subtraction. Uh, so, so basically, like before the signal gets correlated, you have some method that detects whether or not there's RFI in the voltage signal of the antenna. 
and then you like blank those uh those those timestamps basically when you when you correlate the data uh people haven't really tried this for eor yet uh, but it's something that that you could do that i know people are doing research and that's kind of one way you could do it um another thing you can do is you can have an rfi monitor so you can put an antenna on site that is looking at the horizon and seeing whether or not emissions are coming from the horizon at an elevated level and then you can turn the array off during that but that's just as bad as throwing the data out so i don't know if there's like a data sparing way to shield um, the instrument, one natural way to shield it is to just not have such a wide field instrument. If it's only sensitive to this much of the sky, then there's a limited amount of RFI that can make it into the data. Yeah, it's a similar, <clears throat> similar question. Why not use like, something like a notch filter? Right, so if you use some sort of filter that has spectral structure, you have to make sure that that filter does not uh, ruin the signal, the spectral structure of the signal you're also trying to measure. And I think people are just extremely paranoid about that because the dynamic range is so high. It's it's really great that you can see a lot of structures in, in terms of statistical analysis, but um, as an experimentalist, it feels very scary to, you know, build an experiment and do everything on, on your computer. So yeah, I'm not suggesting that uh, we can do everything offline at the end of the day right like i think that a uh, good a good experiment a uh, good observational campaign will have these two teams talking to one another right uh, like if i'm trying to model the systematics i need to i need to talk to the experimentalists the instrumentalists and understand what they did right so um yeah i'm not saying we should just replace everything with bays and then do away with the instrumentalists like of course not yeah, yeah, of course. So um, are there any like strategies right now to actually efficiently calibrate the entire array? Like, for example, the size of Hera? Yeah, so there are methods for doing the calibration, but they make assumptions that are not necessarily perfect, right? So they so what we do is we take a catalog of sources on the sky. Uh, so just a bunch of point sources that have been measured carefully by another telescope. And then we forward model what the raw data should look like. Uh, and then we compare that to our data and we calibrate statistically. So we find a least square solution to figure out what the gains are. Um, and that's, that is the standard calibration technique for these interferometers because we can't like love all of the, all of the elements with the intensity that you can if you only have one, one antenna that you're looking at. Okay, are there any questions on Zoom? So unmute yourself and, and ask. It doesn't look like it. Uh, in that case, uh, let's thank Mike again for a nice talk.